Hello and welcome. In this lecture, we're going to look at Newton's second law in a different way, and we're going to derive one quantity that we're going to call impulse. We're going to derive another quantity that we're going to call linear momentum. So let's start with Newton's second law, and that is the sum of the forces acting is equal to the mass times the acceleration. And the acceleration we can write in a different way because we remember that average acceleration, at least, is change in velocity over time. So let's write it that way, change in velocity over the change in time or some time interval. So we have the net force acting is equal to mass times change in velocity divided by time. Let's multiply both sides of this equation by our delta t. So then we have the net force times the change in time is equal to mass times the change in the velocity. So on the left-hand side of the equation, essentially we have force times time. This we're going to define as the impulse acting on a system. And usually we'll see a capital J for impulse. And on the right-hand side of the equation, mass times velocity essentially is what we have. And we're going to define that as linear momentum. And linear momentum is usually abbreviated with a lowercase p. Now we need to be a little bit careful here because velocity is a vector quantity and so is force. So we're multiplying velocity, a vector, times mass, a scalar. So linear momentum is a vector quantity as well as impulse, capital J. And we're multiplying again force, which is a vector, times delta t, which is a scalar. So we get a vector quantity. So impulse as well is a vector. Looking at the left hand side here, uh, well let's just codify this here. We have force times time is equal to impulse, and we have mass times velocity is equal to linear momentum. And let's take a look at the units for both of these. Uh, force is newtons, time is seconds, so the unit for impulse is usually written as newton seconds. Uh, over here on the right hand side we have mass is kilograms and velocity is meters per second, so the unit for linear momentum is usually written as kilograms meters per second. But notice that a newton is a kilogram meter per second squared, and we're multiplying that by seconds, so we do end up with the same unit here, kilograms, meters over seconds. All right, so if you're ever asked to calculate the impulse acting on a system, it's just net force times time. If you're ever asked to calculate the linear momentum of a system, you just need to do mass times velocity. What's really interesting and where this comes in handy and where it's useful is when we look at the equation together. We have the impulse momentum theorem. And we can use this equation to solve for forces or changes in velocity or even times of impact. Think about a tennis ball hitting a tennis racket. You know, what is the average force acting between the ball and the racket if it comes in at a certain speed and it exits the racket at a certain speed? Uh, think about a golf club hitting a golf ball. It's a very, very tiny fraction of a second that the club and the ball are in contact. And you can figure out forces involved based on the change in momentum. You can figure out impact times based on the change in momentum. So this is actually a pretty useful uh, equation here when you relate force times time to mass times change in velocity. You just need to be very careful because both impulse and linear momentum are vector quantities. So we need to make sure that we are doing vector addition Things moving to the right generally have a positive momentum. Moving to the left have a negative momentum. Forces acting to the right are positive. Forces acting to the left are negative. So be careful. All right, let's take a look at our first example. We have a tennis ball hit hitting a tennis racket. So our ball comes in, moving to the left with an initial velocity of v and mass m. And our ball hits the tennis racket, and it is in contact with the tennis racket for a very short time duration, which we're just going to call delta t. And the ball leaves the racket with a velocity three times greater than it hit the racket with. It still, of course, has mass m. Uh, so lots of questions that we can ask here. Um, we can ask, what is the impulse? Uh, acting on the ball. We can ask what is the change in momentum of the ball, and we can ask what is the force acting on the ball while the racket is in contact with the ball. Because remember, the racket only imparts a force to the ball when they're in contact. 
the racket cannot impart a force to the ball when they're not in contact. So that delta T over here is just the time interval, the very short time interval that the ball is touching the tennis racket. All right, so let's ask the first question. What is the impulse imparted to the ball? Well, let's see here. We know that impulse is equal to force times time. Unfortunately, we don't know what the force is acting between the ball and the racket. So we can't use that to calculate the impulse. But we can use the impulse momentum theorem because the impulse is also equal to the change in the momentum of the ball. So we can find the impulse in one of two ways, force times time or change in momentum. I don't have enough information to find it with force times time, so let's use change in momentum. So the impulse is going to equal mv final minus mv naught, because remember, momentum is mass times velocity, and change in anything is final minus initial. So we have mv final minus mv naught. And we remind ourselves, these are vector quantities. So we're actually doing some vector subtraction here. It's all in one dimension, so we just get to use pluses and minuses for our direction. So inputting what we know here, we've got m times v final, which is a positive 3v. Let's just go ahead and put a positive there, just to emphasize. That is the direction of the vector. And we're going to subtract off m times the initial velocity. Notice that the initial velocity is moving to the left, so that's going to be a negative v. Uh, and again, that negative sign is just the direction. So we are now doing vector subtraction. And simplifying here, we have 3mv plus mv, and we get 4mv is the impulse. And that is to the right. So we think about that. Does that make sense? Which way does the tennis racket have to apply a force to the ball to first get it to slow down? come to rest, and then get it to speed up going to the right. In both cases, the acceleration is to the right. So the force has to be acting to the right. The impulse is acting to the right. Thus, it's positive for mv. Now notice that we can solve another part of this problem. What is the force acting between the tennis racket and the ball? Because again, I know that force times time is equal to the change in the momentum. Well, we already found the change in momentum. It's 4mv. So we can plug this in, and we've got force times our time interval was delta t, as given in the problem, is equal to 4mv. Divide both sides by delta t, and we have an expression for the force. 4mv divided by delta t. And this gives us the force between the racket and the ball. Notice again, the force is acting to the right. Dividing by delta t doesn't change the sign. And we have to be really careful here because the force between the racket and the ball is not a constant. If I drew a graph of the force versus time for the racket and the ball, a constant force between the racket and the ball would look like this. It would just be a nice horizontal line. Unfortunately, that's not actually what we see. When the ball just starts touching the tennis racket, the force goes from zero to something large very quickly. And then as it leaves the tennis racket, it drops back down to zero very quickly. So really, our force versus time graph looks like that. The force isn't constant. So really, what we found here is the average force that is acting between the racket and the ball over that time. So be very careful with that. You're going to have to know some calculus to find any sort of information about the instantaneous force acting. So for right now, be content with the average force acting. All right? One other important thing to note, going back and looking at our force versus time graph is, let's say the force was constant, and we do force times time. Notice we get the area of the rectangle, the area under the curve. That gives us the impulse, or the change in momentum. So if you have a graph of force versus time, area under the curve, change in momentum or impulse. That's pretty important. All right, We can still do the same thing with this curve here. It's the area between that curve and the t-axis, which will give us the impulse. And we need calculus in order to do that. All right, So let's move on to the next concept. So one really important real-world consequence of impulse momentum comes when we look at designing safety equipment. Let's just say that you're a Doubting Thomas and you don't think that 
uh, concussions in the NFL are prevented by helmets at all. So you go ahead and you put on a helmet and you run full force into a wall. Five meters per second to stop very quickly. Now let's say you do the same thing without a helmet. Five meters per second to stop very quickly. In which case is more force acting between the wall and your head. Well, let's again look at our impulse momentum. We have the net force times the time interval is equal to the change in the momentum. In both cases, your change in momentum is the same. You're going from 5 meters per second to 0 meters per second. But in both cases, the delta t is not the same. When you're wearing a helmet, you come to rest in a greater amount of time. And what does that do to the force involved? Well, if we put that delta t back over the other side, we have change in p over delta t. So the change in p hasn't, isn't different for both of those, but the delta t is. If, by wearing a helmet, you can increase that delta t, then you're dividing this whole thing by a larger number. You divide that whole fraction by a larger number, what happens to the force? The force will decrease. If you decrease that delta t by running to the wall without a helmet on, then you're dividing this whole fraction, again, by a smaller number, which is going to have the effect of increasing the force. So when you have this, looking at Newton's second law this way, delta p over delta t, um, if you increase or lengthen the amount of time that a collision takes between your head and the wall, between a car and another car, if you lengthen that amount of time, then you are going to decrease the net force involved. And conversely, if you decrease the amount of time for the collision, then you are going to increase the net force involved. Where might you want that? I don't know. Think about maybe a tennis racket again or a golf club. If you can decrease the amount of time that the impact is happening, you might be able to increase the force that's acting on the ball. All right? And so all safety equipment is designed this way. Airbags in cars, crumple zones in cars, pads in football, helmets in football, shin guards in soccer, all sorts of stuff. If you can lengthen the amount of time of impact, you're going to decrease the force. So much so, if you can double the time of impact, then you can decrease the force by half. If you can triple the time of impact, you can decrease the force by a third. You know, you could take a car crash that has a net force of 50,000 newtons acting on a person and change it so that it's only 25,000 newtons. Change it so that it's only 12,000 newtons. That could be the difference between life and death. All right, so safety equipment is designed with this in mind. Increase the amount of time it takes for that change in momentum. All right? If you have physics one, non-calculus-based physics, you can stop right now. If you're in calculus-based physics, you need to stay tuned to the next section. OK, so how do we get away from talking about that average force and being able to find instantaneous forces or the change in momentum as a result of non-constant forces? And here we need some calculus. So again, going back to Newton's second law, we have the net force is equal to ma, rewriting it with acceleration as the time derivative of velocity. We have m times dv dt. And m times v is momentum. So we can rewrite this as the net force is equal to dp dt. And that is Newton's second law actually as he wrote it and he, as he conceptualized it. If you think about it, it kind of makes sense. If you're applying a non-zero net force to something, the momentum is going to change over time. And this is more general than MA. And the reason it's more general than MA is when we look at MA, we assume that the mass remains constant. The mass of a system remains constant. That's not always the case, right? Think about, I don't know, snow falling in an empty boxcar. The mass of that system is not remaining constant. It's changing over time. And so by writing the second law this way, you can account for changes in mass. You can also account for changes in velocity. And this is actually the more general, uh, slightly more powerful form of Newton's second law. But again, we get an impulse momentum theorem. We have the sum of the forces dt is equal to dp. Whoops, dp. I wrote that wrong. All right. And again, this makes sense. If we apply a force over an increment of time, we are going to change its momentum. We're going to speed it up, we're going to slow it down. How do we know that? Because that's an acceleration, speeding something up, slowing it down. Okay? 
All right, so here we have uh, a slope and an area relationship, just like we have for lots of different concepts in this class so far. All right, so looking at the top equation here, this one right here, we have that the net force is equal to the derivative of momentum with respect to time. So let's say that we have a graph of not just velocity versus time, but mass times velocity, which is momentum versus time, right? And let's say that that's changing like that. Well, this equation right here tells us that the derivative of momentum with respect to time is going to give us the net force. So if I've got a mass times velocity versus time, gra or versus time graph, the slope of the tangent line is going to be the net force. So that's the first relationship. The slope of momentum versus time is going to give you the net force. All right, and we already saw the area argument um, in the previous slide. We had a graph of force versus time. And for that tennis racket, we saw that the force curve kind of looked like that. We take the area under that curve, and that gives us the impulse, but really more importantly, you're not often asked to find the impulse. We really want to know what is the change in momentum of the object as a result of that force acting over that time interval. All right, so there is the slope and area relationship between these two. So going back over here, if we integrate both sides of this equation, we have the integral of F with respect to time is equal to the change in momentum, p final minus p initial. All right, because your limits of integration on this right-hand side are going to be um, p naught to p final. All right, and so we get a calculus-based form of impulse momentum, and so that allows us to deal with non-constant forces, which is really handy because a lot of times we've got an equation for force that depends on time. Remember that when we took the integral of force with respect to position, we got the net work done. Okay, So this is a different force relationship. Take the integral of force with respect to time, and you're going to get change in momentum. So here's an example where we're going to use calculus and the impulse momentum theorem and find out the final velocity here. So we have a force now as a function of time. Uh, and we know the mass of the object is 2 kilograms, and the initial velocity is 0 meters per second. We want to know what is the velocity at 4 seconds as a result of this force acting on the particle. It's a non-constant force. Uh, we cannot use kinematic equations. We can, however, we can use information we already, or skills that we already possess. If this is the force with respect to time, we can divide it by the mass and get the acceleration with respect to time. We can then take that acceleration, and we can integrate it to get the velocity with respect to time. And once we have the velocity function with respect to time, we can find what is the velocity at four seconds. We can do things slightly more elegantly with impulse momentum. So I know that the integral of force with respect to time is equal to uh, dp here, or the change in momentum. Uh, sorry, the integral of dp. So we integrate both sides here. So we have the integral of 3t squared minus 4t. And we're going to do that uh, from 0 to 4 seconds. Those are our limits of integration, because we started out at 0, and we want to know what is it at 4. And we're going to integrate that whole thing with respect to time. Remember that once you integrate, the dt just goes away. And over here, um, the integral of dp is just going to be p final minus p initial. Since the initial velocity is 0, we know that thing just goes to 0 anyway. So the integral on our left-hand side is going to be p final. So let's do it. We have 3t squared. We're going to integrate that. And we get t cubed minus uh, 2t. Am I integrating correctly? Yes, 2t squared. And we're going to integrate that thing from 0 to 4. So we plug things in here. We have 4 cubed minus 2 times 4 squared. And we're going to subtract off the 0 squared minus 2 times 0 squared, which is going to be 0. So on the left-hand side here, we are going to get 64 minus 32, which is going to give us 32. And that's going to equal p final. 
We didn't want the final momentum, though. We wanted the final velocity. Uh, one word on the unit here, that was force times time, so this is newtons times seconds. Remember, that's the unit for impulse. So that's equal to P final, but we wanted the final velocity, so that's going to be M times V final. So dividing both sides by M here, which just happens to be 2 kilograms, we end up with 16 meters per second is equal to V final. And another tool in our toolbox then, impulse momentum to solve for final velocities, for times, for forces, etc. All right? So, going back, really, really, really important to remember these two properties, all right? If we've got a momentum versus time graph, the slope is the force, the net force. And if we have a force versus time graph, the area under the curve is our change in momentum or our impulse. All right? Worth committing to memory. Thanks.